for Evan. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, you have the North Central Climate Science Center here, Robin. Uh, and uh, please move this window away from the shared application. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that everybody can see the Zoom um, and that the teams that are ready to uh, run through their proposed their projects um, are queued up. Um, we actually have five separate teams that we're going to ask to give a, a bit of a brief on today, and I'll give the order in a second. Um, but I think the, uh, the imperative is on conciseness and moving quickly through things. So uh, we're going to call on um, Andy and Arjun first, uh, the climate drivers, MTLs and Candida second, <coughs> excuse me, Dennis and J Shannon and Jill on the adaptation, and then uh, John Bradford and Molly Cross in that order on their projects. So, <coughs> uh, so uh, with that as a uh, short, quick introduction, um, Andy, Arjun, you guys got uh, uh, timed out of the last one, so uh, you're up. Okay, great. Yeah, um, Andy here. <coughs> um, let me give an overview. And uh, so, so our FY17 project um, focus, focuses really on two things. One is doing a uh, vegetation climate adaptation project in the greater Yellowstone with um, the Custer Gallatin National Forest, who's revising their forest plan. And then additionally, um, across the domain, developing resource briefs by which um, the various uh, ecological impacts that we've been quantifying um, can be made available to each of the, uh, the public lands and and, and, and private lands uh, surrounding them, the, the managers of those places. Um, and then we're, we continue to do work on, um, on ecological impacts of drought and water balance um, on vegetation. And we continue to do vulnerability assessments on forest species across the domain. Uh, with regard to the uh, the climate um, adaptation work, um, we actually have really nice progress. So we evaluated among three or four users groups in Greater Yellowstone, which, which ones had decisions front and center that could really benefit from a project like this. The, um, the Custer Gallatin National Forest uh, planning effort really rose to the surface there. So we're working quite closely with Virginia Kelly, who leads the planning team, and with uh, Gunnar uh, Karnwath, who's the ecologist on the project. Um, and then they have uh, five or six other employees of the, of the forest that are involved with the project. Um, the project is being organized by Brian Miller with the, the Climate Science Center, um, Tom Olaf with the Great Northern LCC, um, Molly Cross with WCS, and, uh, and Ann Gunner with uh, the National Forest. We, we've uh, have uh, about 12 additional participants that come from the Park Service, other Forest Service employees. Um, in general, this group represents people that are expert on particular vegetation types, on climate change, on climate change adaptation, on management. And the project has, uh, has two major workshops. We, we did an introductory call last week with the full group and explained the project and expectations of them and got feedback. Uh, 
in mid-April, we'll, we'll have a first workshop that focuses on synthesizing current knowledge on um, major vegetation types and tree species projected response to, to climate change and to disturbance, um, as well as, uh, as trying to do a vulnerability assessment of those. Um, the second workshop will then focus on coming up with and evaluating adaptation strategies for vulnerable elements. And uh, the project is interesting because it's being done, of course, really in the context of the National Forest Planning um, approaches. Um, there's a, of course, there's a deep history on how these forest plans are done, on how vegetation is classified, um, on what, what sorts of forest activities are included in, in these forest plans. And of course, all that was developed before we knew much about uh, p potential human alteration of climate. Um, and so things like vulnerability assessment are not, are not really in, at least the way that the Northern region of the Forest Service has been doing these plans. So we're trying to very carefully uh, work with Gunnar to, to do this in the context of, of their approach, um, but, then, but then add the, the ability, add the vulnerability assessment and the future projection um, into the mix. And just for example, one issue that arises is um, their goals for their desired condition. They basically identify what they want their forest to be like in the future, desired condition. And um, in the Northern region, that's, that's based on being within the so-called natural range of variation, the patterns of the forests that existed in pre-settlement times. Um, now, is that appropriate and applicable and, and useful under projected climate change? It, it might well be in some places for some vegetation types, but it might not be in other cases. And so part of what we're, what we're assessing will be um, for which vegetation types to something other than NRV make, make more sense in terms of uh, desired future condition. Uh, so those are, uh, that's the major thrust of the project. We actually have, we're just today going to be assigning working groups homework to be done before the first workshop. Um, because of the timeline of the, uh, of the National Forest, we, we hope to have a final report <coughs> from the project in August of 18. So this is moving along pretty quickly. Um, regarding the, um, the resource briefs, um, we're really just getting started on that part of the project. We've been uh, talking with other folks in the Climate Science Center about formats that might be, might be most effective. Um, of course, many, many folks in the CSCs are developing resource briefs. Of course, these are something like two-page informative um, summaries of current knowledge about a particular resource and, and how it might be influenced by climate change and potential management strategies. Um, we, we're planning to do them relating to, um, to, to water balance um, issues that is relevant to, to vegetation, um, to um, particularly to um, tree species um, response to, to climate change, um, and also on land use change, work we've done so far, which deals with habitat fragmentation, basically. Um, and then um, our June's really been cranking on the, the forest modeling uh, in short, we have one manuscript in the works that focuses particularly on tree species that we think are um, 
that are strongly limited by potential evapotranspiration, a key water balance measure. And we've, we've evaluated how the, the old way of calculating PET and projected again in the future, and the newer way that's now being done within the MACA data set, um, the extent to which they lead to differing results in terms of area of suitable habitat for species. Um, that's important because many of the, uh, most of the papers that have been done have used the older method and, and so it's important to see if, if those results are robust relative to this newer and probably better method. Um, and then the larger effort for, for some 33 species, uh, our June has run um, species distribution models with a large number of predictors uh, getting a massive set of results um, Aim basically at trying to assess um, changes in area of suitable habitat under um, different climate scenarios. And we would use that as the basis for a vulnerability assessment. Um, Andy, I'm gonna jump in and give you a time check. Uh, can you uh, be on the down slope soon? <laughs> so that, that actually covers the main, the main topic. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so thank you for that. I'm going to suggest, given that we want to get through these presentations, that folks hold any questions or comments uh, till we get a little bit further through. Uh, we could lose our uh, line if we don't watch out. Um, so Imtiaz and Candida, I think you guys are up next. Great. Well, thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, so um, I'm the one reporting. Candida is on travel, so I and I don't see on the phone, so I'll be the only one speaking on our behalf. Um, so yeah, this is the update from the Climate Drivers uh, Foundational Science Area. Um, just to remind you what we do is, you know, we, we do multiple different things. We do some research, we do some tool development, and we engage uh, uh, with users and stakeholders in providing um, uh, data, guidance on science, and integrating climate science into uh, impact assessment and and all the steps going forward towards uh, doing adaptation and uh, strategies development. Um, I've listed uh, a whole set of folks there um, on the title page, uh, uh, and and you know just uh, it's it's a bigger effort. Some people do more work, but you know others inform the project. So um, I'll give you. Um, yeah, quick updates on things, and I'm just doing select updates, so I won't cover everything in the time that I have. Um, so the the thing we are most excited about in terms of dating is um, something we just brought into uh, this world of last week, um, and something we've been working on for several months now. It, it's uh, this drought index called the Landscape Adaptive Response Index, um, calling it drought index in general, but what it does, it provides you um, yeah, at very high resolution and near real time uh, assessment of actual evapotranspiration or deviations in that as percentiles. Um, and the resolution is close to one kilometer here. Um, and so what this index is doing is really providing you information on uh, land surface moistness, um, and uh, it, it's coming, it, and actually um, we have just, uh, I should backtrack a little bit and say that, you know, this work we have been planning to do with Gabriel Sene, and this use directly uses the data set that he has been leading in developing, uh, it's called the, the actual ET data. Uh, through USGS EROS, and we've been working with him to uh, develop this index, um, do some some statistics on it, uh, and develop this index um, uh, that just adds value to what he had previously. And so, yeah, going back to what I was saying, it uh, it's really the way it's designed. It, it's really good at tracking soil moisture in upper layers of soil, and this is something that ecologists uh, really care for this one metric uh, of soil moisture that's accessible to plants and atmosphere more directly. Um, and, 
and so by design, this is so. And so in the map up there, you can see how it's tracking the growing season, uh, Larry, um, for uh, 2017. And uh, in the Northern Plains, you can see how the drought uh, impact is visible. Um, and you, but you can see the spatial detail that it provides. And so this tool, among other things, could be used to just verify models. And I've shared uh, to sell a group of people some model results uh, operational modeling um, results on soil moisture and compared Larry with that and uh, the upper layers of soil moisture um, uh, really tracks track pretty well by Larry. Um, um, Larry complements Eddy, uh, Larry being the surface land surface measure of land surface dryness um, and Eddy being a measure of atmospheric dryness if used uh, intelligently that can provide you with a much better uh, robust sense of a state of drought and uh, severity and, and where it's going. Um, next steps with this product is we would like to develop a time series tool, same as Eddie. Um, it, this, uh, the latest data on Larry we have is, is, is December 2017. We really want to do real time tracking of Larry at least to the latest month. And down the road, we want to bring in the weekly data. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a few updates on Eddy. Um, we have been uh, uh, the Eddy website is, is evolving uh, for the last two years, uh, one and a half years, um, and we have done a couple of webinars to talk about what the new features have been coming. The recent one, uh, Mike Hobbins did that webinar last two weeks, uh, two weeks ago. Um, so uh, one thing we have brought in is this Eddy map archive. So you can go back to 1979 and, and look at several different times, Eddy time scales and, and get a look at the plots. And this, um, this uh, tab also allows you to extract data um, for any of those time scales and all, all of those periods. Um, interestingly, just wanted to sh this is the most, one of the more recent maps of Eddy. What you can see is a classic La Nina signal manifesting in the, in the western U.S. where, you know, the northern part is, is relatively wet. And this is really atmospheric wetness and dryness. And you can see um, real low eddy values over Montana, eastern Montana, which was affected by drought. It's good news for that. It's very limited, much lower, below normal evaporative demand. But in, in the south, things are very different. And you can see quite about normal evaporative demand, especially in the Four Corners region. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing we have added recently is these weekly synopsis. It's just a lot of work. Uh, Mike Hobbins taking the bigger share of work here. Um, but yeah, just providing uh, more information, just, just distilling it for users. Uh, Eddie, is it slightly tricky tools to use? Uh, tricky tool to use um, primarily because there are many uh, time scales to consider and, and just uh, uh, this is an effort to just distill it for folks out there, and we also share this with the USDM um, authors, the US Drought Monitor authors, uh, just so that they're aware of how Eddie's doing. Next, please. Um, so I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to just point out the uh, value of the time series tool. Now, this tool you have to update every year, so yeah, there's some maintenance required in maintaining uh, these data sets and products. Uh, Candida was kind enough to update the, the data set right as uh, December came to a close. Um, and so we could get the 2017 data and just uh, pointing out uh, the value of that. It, you know, if you look at 2017, it, it uh, for July, month of July, it had the highest eddy on the record going back to 1979 for Northeast Montana. So high vapid demand was, was uh, did manifest in that region. Um, uh, in July, and that them um, have you know uh, added feeded the drought stuff there. Next slide, please. Um, MTS, I'm gonna give you a time check. Uh, start to wind if you can. Okay, um, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> more slides, yeah. Just we'll browse through them very fast. So we're doing some work on climate scenarios. Um, something I've been doing. Uh, um, throughout our uh, engagement with CSC. Uh, one 
uh, specific project is the Nature Conservancy's Colorado Nature Conservancy's project. This is a very um, rapid response project. They have one year project where they want to do a lot of climate related thinking. I think it's more of a pilot project and we've developed climate scenarios for that. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, you'll hear more about it as uh, reports and stuff come out, but there is a lot of data and uh, um, development uh, and thinking happening. Um, next, please. Uh, one such work, scenarios work that Andy mentioned that we did with, that we helped them, uh, their group was uh, developing this data. Uh, I had some exchange with Robin this morning about this, but what we did was take an existing uh, downscale data um, and and just derive certain products for them, uh, data layers, so that they can do their scenario work using six different scenarios and, uh, um, and, 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 and do their modeling effort based on that data. And we have published this data. Um, it could be useful for other projects out there and other users. Um, next one, please. This is my last slide here. Uh, this is thanks to Candida. Um, again, this is one of the work that we are taking to publications and develop a resource brief uh, down the road. And this is a, a very comprehensive work which looked at um, snow trends and trends in hydrology over the Wind River region, but really it's kind of in line with what's happening in the Intermountain West in our domain. Um, and again, it's uh, looking at multiple lines of evidence and how this uh, uh, changes in snow and water balance happening in the region. Um, so I won't go into more detail here. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so moving right along, we'll pick up with the adaptation FSA. Dennis, I'll turn to you first. Actually, Shannon's going to go first. Oh, okay. Shannon's going to go first then. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Hi. So, um, my understanding was we were supposed to be five minutes each and we were supposed to focus on the stakeholder engagement. So, that's what I'm going to talk about um, very quickly because we haven't actually started our portion of this funding yet, um, which is really to make sure that. Um, it's building on several projects that we're working on right now and making sure that the science and the decision support is actually helping to inform decisions. So next slide. <clears throat> so the, so the sets of stakeholders um, that we are, have been working with and will continue working with, one of which is the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and what we put in the fiscal year 17 funding was basically to expand the social ecological systems work that we've been doing, um, focusing on uh, people who are dependent on land and res public land and resources, particularly BLM, public land and resources, um, <clears throat> and making sure that we are helping to inform resource management planning, um, throughout Colorado, as well as um, hopefully expanding it beyond Colorado. There's been some interest to look at expanding it more broadly throughout the region and throughout the nation. Um, the other aspect that we built in there was to continue our tribal engagement, building on the lessons learned from the Wind River Reservation model and helping to build capacity of tribes in the region with drought and climate adaptation. Hopefully um, we'll have our new tribal liaison coming on soon that we'll be working with. And then lastly, uh, continuing to work on the SES um, drought work, the drought risk and adaptation in the interior and informing the eco drought um, effort that is both regionally focused and focused nationwide. Next slide. So, you know, we follow this co-production model. You can, you can, um, Go ahead and advance through the bullets. This is stuff I've actually presented already, I think, to most everyone on the on this webinar about the model that we followed for the Wind River project, um, how we structured our uh, management team, science teams, technical advisory board, um, how we structured our monthly meetings and webinars and had all hands meetings between all the teams and multiple in-person workshops 
and um, multiple rounds of interviews, field visits, um, community education outreach. So we really built in a very kind of holistic, comprehensive project with um, very frequent and ongoing stakeholder engagement. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and so the email that Aparna sent out really wanted us to focus on best practices for engagement. So even though we haven't necessarily started the fiscal year 17 work per se, again, this is kind of building on what we've already learned from previous projects. So just some of the things that um, we wanted to share about best practices for engagement is um, early and often engagement as much as possible and, and especially in-person travel is really important. Uh, and this is especially true when working with tribes, really going out to the communities and reservations for face-to-face -face engagement. Next, bullet. Um, <clears throat> building the research and partner team around local needs and priorities, specifically focusing on, um, in our context, uh, management priorities. Next, next one. Um, it's really important to provide decision support as early as possible if you can. So for example, in the Wind River project, um, we started working on developing the, the drought and climate summaries before we even started the technical assessment. And that was really effective in not only building the relationships, providing early decision support, but also um, um, it really helped us understand more what kind of information they were already using and how we could augment that. Next bullet. Um, setting realistic goals early in the process, but enabling enough flexibility for the project to evolve. So this is, we built this flexibility into the fiscal year 17 funding so that we could make sure that we're building on existing projects, but also again, trying to expand those and disseminate um, best practices, lesson learned and decision support beyond just those existing projects. Next. Um, embedding funds for the managers into the proposal in the research. So really, you know, as much as you can, um, building them in as partners, as opposed to just quote unquote stakeholders who will receive your information at the end of the project. So really that co-production kind of model. Next. <coughs> Are we frozen? No? Oh. Um, Six is really in line with five, again, kind of including them in the research ex itself when applicable and last, I think, bullet. So for us, um, this social ecological systems approach and really using a community-based participatory approach has been really um, fundamental to our success, success in these projects in terms of really documenting and understanding the local context in terms of um, again, what kind of information they, they use, what kind of information they need, what are some of the um, barriers and adaptive capacities that they have for uh, both using your science as well as building it into adaptation and resource management planning. So um, again, this has been our model that we followed, this you know, SES co-production model that uh, for us we feel has been a real key to our success. I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Dennis and Thanks. I are going to finish out this section. So. You guys are up next. Go for it. So, in thinking about how we move forward, it actually built um, really nicely from what Shannon presented because we kind of share the same ideas. Really, we're, we're looking at you know sort of how to develop, uh, further develop the actual science agenda um, using a social ecological system framing, and so we have. Um, a workshop planned uh, March 5th through 7th. That's really looking at um, the social science component of this. And this sort of follows on uh, from a previous meeting where we looked at more of the biophysical aspects of evapotranspiration and drought um, last uh, fall. And so after we have this meeting, uh, it's anticipated to have a third meeting where we bring more of this together actually start working with some of the managers to look at how we um, implement um, this strategy. But I, I think so far looking at the various projects dealing with drought within the region that we have a really nice um, uh, set of projects to share their information about how they've been approaching um, drought decision making within the region and actually even outside the region. Uh, and based on that, um, 
really start defining uh, what the socio-ecological uh, framing of how we move forward uh, with agenda, this agenda uh, will be formulated. Um, hopefully we'll um, generate a series of publications from this as well as um, put together a symposium or um, some sort of workshop for AGU next, next fall. So I'll pass that on. All right, and I'm talking about the third piece of the um, adaptation FSA. So the goal of the evaluation, uh, or the, no, the, the goal of the Climate Science Center is to produce science that is useful, usable, and used. But the challenge is, what does this look like in reality? How do we actually measure this? So um, at our five-year review that happened in January of last year, um, the review team asked us to document the value of our science and to really close the loop with stakeholders, um, asking them questions about whether they got what they needed from us, how they used the science we produced, and were outcomes different, and if so, how, um, when decisions were made using our science. Um, in, in short, they asked us to show the impact of our research. Um, so Aparna uh, Bamsai Dodson and I are collaborating on um, an evaluation and we're starting with um, a survey of stakeholders who were involved in the projects that were completed since the inception of the center. Um, for those who are interested, our IRBs are both approved. <laughs> um, we, uh, we're looking at how to define a suite of implementable evaluation metrics and identify the appropriate context for transferability, um, considering things like scale, timing, space, or uh, ge geographical extent and intent. And the survey will have three parts. Um, in the first part, we're really trying to get at uh, looking at the engagement in the process of knowledge production. The second part will look at um, the use of information, um, including outputs and outcomes. And the, the last uh, part of the survey is based on um, the building of relationships and trust, um, so Im impacts. Um, I will also be doing a series of either interviews or focus groups um, as a follow on to the survey. The, the uh, topics for these aren't defined yet. Um, it'll be, uh, they will emerge hopefully <laughs> from the survey results and um, I will hone in on topics uh, for those at a later date. But some ideas that we, they might cover are to identify management agency science needs, define and understand planning schedules and decision calendars for different agencies, or to understand how our science can be injected at the right time and in the right format in order to be useful. Um, so the outcomes of this evaluation process, um, it will also inform our strategic science planning that's happening right now. Um, we hope to develop scalable metrics for evaluating future projects and um, a big somewhat uh, fuzzy <laughs> outcome will be right now to get PIs familiar with and thinking about evaluation early in the process, even from the proposal stage, as well as informing the requirements of future RFPs that we release. So that's all I have okay. for now. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to thank everybody who's gone so far. We're on time, so uh, we're moving through this very well. Uh, John Bradford, you're up next. Go for it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, so this is the uh, this is a relatively small project looking at synthesizing the state of the science with respect to pinion juniper. Um, this just to provide a little bit of background. The need for this emerged from a series of sort of small regional workshops that the Southern Rockies LCC conducted in the past couple of years in the Four Corners and the Upper Rio Grande uh, regions. And they were querying resource managers about what are, your, what, what are some of your key challenges and the, um, the issues related to pinion juniper ecosystems kept emerging time and time again. Um, and interestingly, the, the different issues identified and challenges and uncertainties that were that were climate related really varied based on where you were and this sort of highlights the challenge of pinion juniper that it's a really widely distributed 
um, system. So in some places, folks were clearly concerned about the recent mortality of pinyin and thus what that might suggest about the long-term viability of pinyin juniper systems that are used for all, all sorts of, of different pur purposes ranging from cultural to, to recreational. Um, and other folks were then equally concerned about juniper encroachment into places that didn't have juniper historically and the implications of that for both wildlife habitat and grazing um, productivity and forage production, all those kind of issues. So there's a lot of a lot of diverse uh, perspectives um, and a lot of questions from the participants about, well, how do we deal with this? What, what, what should we be doing? Do we think of pinion junipers as sort of closed canopy, low elevation forests that have are fire adapted like ponderosa, or are they much more, do they much more behave like shrublands of sagebrush? And so um, <clears throat> it became clear that we really needed a, a synthesis about the sort of state of knowledge for these systems. And so that's where this uh, idea emerged. So we're working to um, to really pull together all the relevant literature. We've we've taken a fairly comprehensive approach to this. We're doing a formal search in Web of Science, um, searching on all the Latin names and the common names for the for the most important dominant species that that characterize pinion and juniper. Uh, that's generated about 1,300 different publications. We're currently working through those trying to characterize, the first step is to determine if they are um, a paper that has some results that are relevant to these management related questions. And the kind of questions we're looking at are things like, what's the historical role of disturbance uh, in PJ? Uh, what are the sort of stand structural reference conditions that people should be working toward? What are the best practices for promoting those conditions? Um, how do land treatments affect the structural conditions and also the forage production? Um, and what are the climate and soil water conditions that tend to support PJ and, and how are they moving? How might those, the distribution of those be shifting in the future and what does that suggest about the long-term viability? So it looks like we've, we've come through about 300 of those 1,300 papers so far um, and about two-thirds of those we end up excluding from our, our generation of a database because they relate to all sorts of other issues um, that aren't management specific. But th that looks like we might, if that trend continues, we might have 400, maybe 450 papers that, that are really relevant to this. We're pulling all these together into a big database um, and we're gonna generate a few products. Uh, one is a, a pretty short state of the science brief, which is really designed for busy resource managers to give them the big highlights about sort of what's known, but perhaps more importantly, point them to an online database that has all these papers for for their use if they want to dig in more into one of these particular topics. So we're still working on exactly how that online database is going to look. It'll probably be both some sort of tabular format that provides people with information about these references and also certainly an EndNote database for if folks want to download that and dig through it themselves. Um, we're also working on a, uh, envisioning a state of the science report that both has a little more information and details about the um, the state of, what, of what's known with respect to these management related challenges and perhaps even more importantly for the Climate Science Center identifies really crucial knowledge gaps that are not, not well filled. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do is, is address these questions and characterize the knowledge, um, recognizing that pinion juniper is, is highly diverse across its range. So um, the kind of practices and strategies and management techniques that are appropriate in one place are not going to be appropriate in others. And so that creates an inherent challenge. Uh, the last thing we're hoping to do with this, and we're really going to have to see how all the papers come together, is do one or more formal quantitative meta-analyses in which we try to actually <clears throat> provide some quantification of the response of, say, understory forage productivity to different kinds of treatments and how that response varies across the climatic conditions that characterize uh, pinion juniper systems. Now, the trouble with that, with being certain of that at this point, is we just don't know if we're going to have enough papers to do that sort of formal quantitative meta-analysis. But our hope is to have this wrapped up um, sometime within, hopefully, calendar 2018 or so, and thereabouts, and, and have these products out. And then we're planning to distribute them um, among the Southern Rockies LCC, if there's still if there's still sort of a functioning organization with that, and and probably do a webinar and some other dispersal ways as well. So, any questions?
Now we're unmuted. Uh, thank you. That was great. Um, and I'll just remind people that uh, we're <clears throat> this notion of state of the science uh, reports is a, I'll call it a new line of business here. We're uh, accepting proposals for that. That's something that's gotten great support from our partners. And so we're going to invest some money in it. Um, but I'll move on to last but not least, I believe, uh, Molly Cross on the Species of Conservation Concern Project. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. So um, this project is one that evolved out of discussions with Robin and Aparna and myself and Shelley Crosby, who's the other co-PI on this project, where we discussed the fact that the CSC was really interested in taking a more systematic look at some of the management decision-making opportunities and priorities that exist within the North Central region, um, specifically related to species of conservation concern. And looking for sort of uh, taking a systematic look for decision making priorities and opportunities that have a nexus with climate change adaptation science to help the CSC set some near term priorities for, uh, for investing some of their funding in targeted management relevant work. And so we have designed a project where right now we're in what I'm calling phase one, which is trying to identify those near-term priorities. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute and how we're going about doing that. But the idea is that identifying those priorities is not sort of just the end point, but we are also developing some ideas for work we could do in the coming year, what I call phase two, which is once we identify some near-term priorities that are important to the CSC to pick one of those and pilot a co-production process focused on one of those priorities where that process would be aimed at understanding, better understanding the decision context that managers are working in, uh, looking at how climate change could inform or influence that decision and ultimately identifying what if any additional information or planning would be helpful to making a more climate informed decision. So uh, right now, again, we're working on that first phase, which is just about better understanding what some of the near-term uh, priorities and decision-making opportunities there are related to species of conservation concern in the North Central region. And we are doing that through targeted interviews with state fish and wildlife managers. And we have uh, developed the interview protocol. It has received IRB approval or exemption. And we are kind of ready and chomping at the bit to go and get started with these interviews. Um, but recent weeks have been spent doing some careful coordination with the National USGS Office and the National and Regional Fish and Wildlife Service um, programs as well to make sure we're uh, coordinated in our efforts in reaching out to states because there's a lot of uh, work right now to better understand state level priorities and we want to make sure our project is is uh, in line with and not duplicative with other efforts going on. So we are hoping to start those interviews very soon, conduct them in the next month or two depending on on scheduling and, and how quickly we can conduct the interviews. And the idea is that these interviews will help us get a much better sense of what some of those priorities are for states that are, you know, species that are a high priority for the states and the subject of some relatively imminent decision making, say in the next two to three to four years, such that um, well, and, and our species for which climate information or planning would be helpful to making a more climate informed decision. So trying to sort of find opportunities at the intersection. Um, so the interviews will gather state level information on what are important to individual states in this region. And then we will sit down with Robin and Aparna and some other targeted folks to help us sort of digest that information and think about um, you know, what priorities are relevant to multiple states and therefore maybe a particularly worthwhile topics for the CSC to focus on um, at the sort of regional level. 
Uh, again, the idea is that we'll, once we identify some of those priorities, then we can start to bring together scientists and managers into some kind of a co-production working group that can take a closer look again at the decision context for that species, for those species. Again, next year we would probably pick one species to start with. Um, and then do some, some targeted conversations about the decisions and how climate change could inform them so that we can identify some targeted gaps in information or planning that is needed to advance those decisions. Uh, I don't know, Shelley, if you have anything additional you wanna add to my description or Robin or Aparna, given that we've been working closely on this, feel free to jump in or if there's any questions, I can say more. Um, yeah, this is Robin. I, I'll just uh, add a little bit of flavor. Um, the coordination that Molly referred to is the result of a, a very high focus um, in Washington these days on the fact that the Fish and Wildlife Service has a significant backlog of species that need to be evaluated as to whether they should be listed. So this they call a pre-listing backlog. Um, there's a bunch of work going on uh, where USGS is moving resources to help uh, resolve that. So we're, we're, uh, we've been asked to slow down a little bit. We're a little bit out in front of them. And so we just want to present a, a coherent face. Um, I said earlier, we, uh, we're going to um, hold questions. So I'll maybe open it up now. Um, Shelly, I may have jumped in if you want to say something, but I'll let other folks know if you have questions. Uh, I think you can raise your hand or unmute yourself or what have you. Yeah, this is Molly. Again, Shelley, I don't know if you have anything else to add. I will just say that um, just maybe just one more comment on our timeline. Obviously, it depends on when we can actually get started with the interviews and how long they'll take. But our hope is that over the course of the summer, we'll have identified sort of a, a short list of priorities for the for the regional CSC and then selected one of them to focus on, hopefully if we can continue this work, select one to focus on, um, again, by convening a co-production working group. And I did wanna just make sure I say that, you know, until we know what those species are or what that species might be, it's hard to, to you know, envision all the details of what that co-production process might look like. But for example, I, I very much look forward to connecting Shannon with you and others that are working on these sort of approaches to co-production so that we can hone some of our uh, methods and ideas and align them with, with uh, what you guys are, are uh, working with and, and have you know, the lessons you've learned in the work you guys have been doing. So over the course of the summer, we'll likely be reaching out to um, talk about those kinds of topics if, for, with folks who are willing to work with us and give us advice. So just a, a comment, um, this goes back to MTIAZ's um, efforts with um, Eddie and the new product, Larry, um, and looking at sort of the usableness of it, um, the Colorado Drought Planning um, Committee, uh, which both he and I are on, um, have been looking at um, initially the Eddy product um, and using that and looking at the current drought conditions in Colorado. Um, and they're quite interested in looking at the Larry um, advancements as well. So looking at those ET and evapor demand products, I think is, is a usable uh, component you know, coming out of our joint efforts with um, NOAA. Um, I, I don't know if there's other, within the NOAA family, um, MTIs, you can identify other uh, groups um, looking in using this. I think that the, the North, Northern Plains hub is actually looking at this as well as um, in, uh, early indicator of drought uh, within our domain. Um, Dennis, yeah, I, I hope so that people find these tools useful and usable. And I think our intention is really um, to just kind of do as much a, of an outreach and of these tools uh, and engage folks. And, you know, I understand uh, the weaknesses and strengths and added value of these tools ourselves more strongly. Um, yeah, I think the high spatial resolution and uh, and to, to a degree clear interpretation of some of these things would be helpful. Um, with Larry, I think Eddie is, is really um, getting in people's psyche out there as a, an additional tool that looks at uh, the specific niche of uh, drought uh, water balance component. Uh, Larry is coming out there, but I think uh, one of the, the intention Gabriel had was really kind of take it out to the people and that's 
what we're trying to do with, with that, uh, that specific data set. But I'm not sure anybody at NOAA, people are aware at NOAA, mostly in my team, but uh, widely, I'm not sure. We, we, I did reach out with the use drug monitor folks and I've uh, been giving the data set to them. I connected with some other people in the field and they, they show excitement about this product, just kind of, especially with Larry in terms of that, they, they, it's probably getting at those fields that um, the information is needed on, especially soil moisture, which is really an important metric for ecologists. Thanks. I see that Andy just um, raised his hand on yep. the Zoom, so go ahead, Andy. Yeah, MTS, your, uh, your maps of the extreme drought in July of 17, right, versus the uh, current um, wet condition in eastern Montana, uh, it's just so interesting. <clears throat> Uh, and as you, have, I, you and I talked when we were last together, you know, maybe both are influenced by, by human, by human, are influenced by uh, greenhouse gas effects. Um, but I just think it's a, it's notable for us to think eco, to think about the ecological consequences of this, and it brings to mind, uh, you know, the situation in California where they had drought for quite a while, several years. <laughs> then the very wet period uh, that produced high fuel loads that <clears throat> led to unprecedented fires and then rain that led to mudslides, you know, that both of which killed several people. Um, it just makes me think about in our domain, um, expanding our thinking from drought alone to the, um, the climate variability and, and how that variability can set up you know, disasters or ecological challenges um, that are actually kind of hard to anticipate. I don't know if anybody you know, has, has thoughts about you know, the importance of those types of, of that climate variability or how we might include it in our work. Andy, I think that's a great point, uh, I, I, and I think this is part of the conversation I've had with people out there, and I also try to emphasize that these are the cascading effects of climate change and climate variability, um, and, and the examples you mentioned for California and something that could be very true for um, what's going on in Montana right now uh, with fires followed by you know a very uh, wet uh, period. Um, uh, you had a lot of snow this year. But I think that that's very important and to bring that into context because that's really very important and useful and relevant information and how do, how do we bring it and make it useful to people 